Welcome to the Organization of Professional Astrologers Research Lecture, the scope of research in astrology. Now, my plan today is to start with a bit of history and then look at some questions. When did astrological research truly begin? And why are we looking for evidence and not trying to prove astrology? I want to show you how skeptics tried very hard to disprove astrology in the 1980s and as a result research flatlined for 20 years. How this backfired and the tide started to turn in the 21st century and we now have some 80 studies that support astrology. I'm also going to look at how critics of astrology are now trying to debunk this evidence with p-hacking which I'll explain and dismissing the effects as being weak. I'll also show you a crafty way to work out effect size. This is important. Effect size is important because it enables us to compare and review different studies in a meta-analysis. And I've graphed several meta-analyses of 18 recent results. And one of the discoveries is the skeptics were right. Single factor studies are weak, but they were wrong because multi-factor studies are stronger and whole chart studies are super powerful. Now, consulting astrologers knew this all along. But what we get from this is we, can, we know now that the type of study that we do determines how big a sample you require. So I'll show you how to work out the minimum sample needed for your test. So research is not about studying on YouTube or trying to take the human heart from astrology or even trying to prove astrology to people who prefer to put their faith in dark matter than in the impact of the moon on the tide. It is none of the above. Astrological research is the oldest form of research starting in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East over 3,000 years ago. And we are following a long tradition. It starts with the observation of planetary positions and people and events on Earth. From this, we identify a pattern and we form a hypothesis. We check previous research on the topic and then we start to collect sample data. We set up a control group and then measure the results to see if there's a significant deviation or correlation between the control group and your sample group. Eventually you write this up into a report with an explanation and analysis and a possible conclusion. And then you submit it to a scientific or academic journal. Now this is where I come in as editor of Correlation Journal for Astrological Research. I will review your article if it has potential. I may have to tidy it up so that the format conforms with the APA style. Now APA being the American Psychological Association we use their style because it helps to have consistency throughout the journal and other journals will have similar practices. Anyway, I will then send the paper out to be peer reviewed by at least one expert in the field. And this is always a little bit tricky. We're a very small field. Nobody likes to give criticism or receive criticism, but it has to be done because when you combine ideas from several astrologers, the paper becomes much more powerful compared with then you have a lone astrologer who will have gaps, who will miss many things. This is really what I would call a collegial approach uh, to research and it is very productive indeed. Anyway, hopefully the paper once submitted will then pass peer review and then it will come into an upcoming edition of Correlation. Now, from the 60s right through to the 90s, there was a series of tests that tried to prove or disprove astrology. These involved getting astrologers to match subjects with their charts in blind tests. The, they are known as the, the Vernon Clark type tests after the author of the first VC test. And there were many problems with this type of test that has been more or less, I mean, the test has been more or less abandoned. There was never a winner 
you know, everybody said, oh, yes, we won. You know, um, the astrologers and the skeptics, they all thought that they got the, the best out of it. I, I happen to know the astrologers did, but that's neither here nor there. If the astrologers guessed the charts correctly, the critics said, ah, but they're being psychic or intuitive or reading other cues. There was never, it was like a no win in that situation. And as we all know, guessing charts, people's charts, is not what astrologers do or what we're trained for. A classic example of why this is a problem was in 1985 in the Carlson test, which I'll come on to later, uh, the subjects were asked to recognize their results from a psychological test that they had done themselves. So you write the questions about yourself, then you ask to match it with other people, and they couldn't do it. Uh, or not to a significant level. But Carlson decided that it was astrology that failed, which he didn't, and not psychology, which obviously he had failed. But the most important point of all is that these results are useless. They don't add to our understanding of astrology. There's no analysis to how and why the astrologers made the right choices. Now, in the last few years, a Canadian researcher has found a way of getting around these problems by using software. Vernon Clark tests are usually a choice of two or three matches, sometimes more. Vincent Gobu attempted to match up the birth charts of 73 celebrities with their biographies. Now, if this was just random, you would get seven matches. Using his software, he got 24 matches. Now, this may not sound a lot, but in fact, the chances of getting that 24 right by chance is one in 25 million. This is like a huge number. So from this matching test, Vincent has been able to refine his techniques and make comparisons. So not only do we have an objective match, but we can he can also test the multiple techniques that he used, and this will enhance our field. And here is where he's comparing the use of midpoints on the cover of correlation in this graph. And you can look at different types. And when you compare them, you start to think, oh, you know, I'll try this way. This might, this might enhance what I'm doing. So tests that enable astrologers to be more effective in their analysis of charts and in advising clients are my priority. And sure, good research does impress academics and those who make decisions. And this will open new doors for astrologers. Now, ah, evidence and proof. Now, the problem with proof is that it is impossible in any field other than mathematics. And this is why Darwin's theory of evolution is a theory and not a law. Uh, we get a situation where Kepler's three laws of planetary motion were refined by Newton with his laws of motion and universal gravitation. And then they were modified by Einstein uh, with his special theory of relativity but you note that we come from laws down to theories and that's really what happens so these are the, the different perspectives on from different directions we've got this the skeptic top left got the scientists and they are not the same a lot of skeptics are not scientists and uh, and even if they're trained as scientists they often lose the scientific approach of open inquiry and when I say skeptics, I'm talking about arch skeptics. I'm not talking about general term skeptics. And then there are the mystics, or maybe the, the mythos, and you know, astrologers who say there's no point proving anything. And as far as we're concerned, we're looking for evidence. We're not looking for proof. So proof is elusive. And skeptics have a thing that they want extraordinary proof. This is a difficult one. I'll quote you here. In science, the burden of proof falls upon the claimant. And the more extraordinary the claim, the heavier is the burden of proof demanded. And to the mind of the sociology professor, Trutzi, astrology is extraordinary. Now, this might seem very unfair that we have to go the extra mile in our tests, but it's not so wacky. If someone told you there was a UFO overhead, you check it more carefully than if they claim there was an aeroplane overhead. So it is not an unreasonable request, but it is one that means we have to work harder than most. And uh, and that has always you know, limited us, but, uh, but even so, we work on it. Now, 
Remember the first part of the quote, the burden of proof is on the claimant. That's important because that means if anyone claims astrology is bogus, then they should provide evidence that they have tested the claim. Strangely enough, the richest seam of evidence comes from skeptics in the 1980s. This all started with American philosophy professor Paul Kurtz, who was very disturbed by the spread of sun sign astrology in the media. So he teamed up with other similar minded skeptics to set up various tests to disprove astrology. Across the Atlantic, Michel Gauquelin, supported by his wife Francoise, had been producing remarkable results for nearly 30 years by this time. Their research pointed to a correlation between celestial influence at birth and eminence in various fields, including sport, science, medicine, armed forces, politics, writing, journalism. It was only a matter of time before the worlds of Gokuna and Kurtz collided. Now, there were several failed attempts to dis debunk Gokuna's work in France and in Belgium by skeptical groups, and they were not successful. So Kurtz decided that uh, he'd have none of that. He would, he would actually test the theory out on American sports stars where he would collect the data. But it, it not only did he not succeed, it was worse. He was actually busted for cheating in his desperation. Kurtz got so carried away in cherry picking sports stars that he unwittingly created a significant negative effect. And this spurious result alerted statisticians. So since that time, there have been 14 replications of the, of the Gokulans claims. Also, around this time, 1985 in California, a 19 year old physics graduate at Berkeley in California, Sean Carson, started recruiting astrologers for a blind matching test. And what the astrologers didn't know at the time was that this was another ploy from Kurtz and Psychop in their master plan to dump astrology in the dustbin of history. The Carlson test was ultimately published in Nature, and it claimed that the astrologers were unable to blind match horoscopes with psychological profiles. Since then, criticism of the test has come from three professors, including Hans Eysenck, the most famous psychologist at the time. Professor Ertl later was able to show that the astrologers were able to make the three-way rating of their choices to a significant level. Not highly significant, but significant. Nevertheless, P equals 0 0.037. Meanwhile, an associate of Kurtz and Psychop fellow, Dr. Jeffrey Jean, returned to Australia from advising Carlson in San Francisco on his test. Now, Dean was previously an astrologer and he had been recruited by to join the Kurtz team to become a ninja skeptic. He was now on a mission. In 1985, he started his epic series of papers. His claim was that the charts of people with extreme scores on Hans Eysenck's extroversion and neuroticism personality scales did not correspond with the four elements in astrology. Fortunately, he very kindly provided me with the data. He had astrologers try to match, but what they, what nobody seemed to understand was that they had assumed that there was a certain match between the elements and the qualities of um, the, the, the personality types. And the problem was that the keywords used by Isaac were different from the keywords we would use as astrologers. So if you look at the, um, the diagram, you will see that it's very clear that the fire qualities or uh, the red ones on the right are all in the extroversion zone. So that was fairly easy. Now the earth qualities all fell exclusively in the introversion zone. Again, that was easy. The air was neither introvert nor extrovert, but it was emotionally stable, which makes sense for air. As you see the green qualities down below. And the problem with the scale is that water was the problem. A lot of psychological testing and ranking of personalities is they don't seem to understand water. They see water as like a problem almost. So water was none of the above. It fell into all categories. Anyway, when I 
tested the sun, moon, and the ascendant for these qualities. The, there was a very good fit with the fire and extroversion, the earth uh, corresponded with introversion, the air with emotional stability, but the water would not fit with anything. And I, I guess it was never going to be possible. Now, in 2020, I came across a wonderful book called A Scheme of Heaven, Astrology and the Birth of Science. Uh, the author, Alexander Boxer, who's not an astrologer, writes about the history of astrology with great respect and intelligence. However, he did try a test using an ancient claim from Roman astrologer Marcus Manilius of a connection between the sign of Libra and the law. Manilius didn't specify whether it was the sun sign or what, but there was a connection. Boxer did his test by counting the number of Libra sun signs among all U.S. Supreme Court judges, or all those who had a known date of birth, which in fact, since 1789, only one of them, you couldn't get the date of birth. And it turned out that the number of Librans was just about average. And I wasn't really surprised by that result. I wouldn't, uh, anyway, however, when you think about it, U.S. Supreme Court judges are not standard practicing lawyers. They are judges and their speciality is jurisprudence, which is the philosophy of the law, the understanding of the Constitution. And judges come under the realm of Sagittarius. So I checked for a combination of Libra and Sagittarius in the charts of 114 Supreme Court justices using mutual reception. That is Jupiter conjunct Venus, Venus and Sag and Jupiter and Libra. So I'm actually getting the signs or the, uh, the these quality, these archetypes to mix within the chart. So the person expresses both. It's not like, oh, you've got a lot of Libra and a lot of Sag. That might come out differently, but this is where they merge within the um, nature of the person. And the correlation was, was high. P equals 0 0.001. That is a one in a thousand chance that this result happened by chance. So Boxer's claim was not so much wrong, but typical of popular belief that testing only sun signs is actually testing astrology. Besides being a straw man argument, he should have created a control group, perhaps to reflect the seasonal birth patterns and a sample of at least 10 times the size to actually do the test they wanted to do. What is interesting to me is when Katanja Brown Jackson was confirmed as the next justice to join the Supreme Court this year in 2022, the, it then waited, the te test became even more significant, considerably more. The reason is that she had a Venus-Jupiter conjunction. It happened to be within two degrees, didn't make it any stronger. The fact that she had it within orb uh, meant that she counted. Now, failing to find evidence is not actually limited to skeptics confirming their own prejudices about astrology. A team of astrologers worked on the New York suicide study in 1985, and yet they were unable to find any pattern in the natal charts of the subjects that differed from the control group. There isn't time to explain how this happened, but I will say that Jeffrey Dean, the skeptic I mentioned earlier, acted as an advisor. That is just park that thought. And an overwhelming number of techniques were used by the astrologers, as you can imagine. In my review of the study, I, I had a different thought and I just went very simply for um, signs and planets and houses and aspects and major aspects. I'm not saying that other things don't work, but you can get overwhelmed. And I only focused on very traditional parts of astrology. And there's tons more to find in that study. You know, people are welcome to carry on. It'd be great. But in my review, anyway, I discovered there were many results where the suicide victim differed significantly from the control group. And these were all in line with traditional astrology. Anyway, this is the, the myth of, of hundreds of tests. Now, despite the, the fact that all the largest and most important tests have ended up supporting astrology, the ones I've outlined before. These were the big ones of the 80s and um, skeptics uh, Dean and his fellow co-authors, 
uh, who publish books quite regularly. They claim that hundreds of scientific tests have solved the puzzle that astrology fails to work. Well, I'm sorry, that's just totally false. Dean, I asked Dean to cite a, a single study that falls into the category, and he was he was not able to. Well, well, he couldn't cite one that didn't fall into one of these five categories. That either there are tests with tiny samples, and we can't count them, or they were flatally flawed, and obviously you can't count them, or there were straw man tests, and so you're testing something that astrologers never actually said, or they were limited to sun sign single factor tests. And lastly, there were tests that supported astrology. Uh, tests seem to fall into those categories, but obviously I'd be welcome to, someone can show me a test where astrology really didn't work and that they could give me the data. Because if I have the data, I might find that it does work because I'm an astrologer and a researcher. And I think that if you're just a researcher without understanding the process, you are on limited ground. Anyway, so this is Correlation Journal. A lot of what we do is testing claims and providing evidence. We're the oldest and best known peer reviewed journal for astrological research. But we are both open to quantitative and qualitative studies. But our main interest lies in quantitative tests where the data can be measured and counted, leading to statistical evidence. Qualitative studies tend to have smaller samples and are more descriptive. Now, in correlation, in 2020, I listed over 60 quantitative studies that supported the notion of astrology. And by that, I mean the correlation between the celestial positions and movement of planets and life and events on planet Earth. So here's the updated graph showing 79 quantitative studies since 1960, and it's listed by each year. But as you can see, over there's a trend, there's an upward trend. Over the 60 year, one year span, over half were published in the last 12 years. And more than that, most of the studies in the 20th century were by the Gauquelins or connected with their work. So we have a real renaissance of study into astrology happening right now. Now, almost all these tests would have been through peer review, would have been published, and obviously the results are all statistically significant. Now, statistical significance, I mentioned P, the P, the probability value, and I'm sure most of you will know what it is already. But if you don't, I need to tell you that it informs us of the probability a result occurred randomly. Our standard threshold for significance is P is less than or equal to 0 0.05. That is a 5% or a 1 in 20 chance that a result happened by chance. This is the way we state it. In our field, the samples are generally compared with a control group or with expected values. But control group is better for one very important reason. There are many reasons, but one of which is that the planets do not move in a very consistent way as far as we're concerned. And so you can get anomalous results, but that's another topic. Anyway, no matter how strongly the hypothesis is supported by the statistical significance, this, all of this is evidence. It's not proof. It, will, it is always still possible that an effect may be accounted for by unknown artifacts or it is simply not due to astrological influences. You've got to keep that in mind. P-hacking. OK, so the evidence is accumulating as researchers produce excellent papers supporting astrology. And now... There are fewer artifacts. Astrology critics increasingly resort to debunking solid studies by p-hacking. What is p-hacking? It's the practice of reanalyzing data in many different ways to yield a target result. Now that is often used for people at universities who need to get their p below the 0 0.05 and, and they tinker with their study. And it's, it's quite a common practice, and quite often you can see papers just slip into you know, 0.04, just significance. 
and it's just an arbitrary number. You know, there are, there are there's a history as to why, but it's not it's not a magic number. Doing p, p hacking from our point of view is where they change the result. They make it they take away the significance. The skeptics take away the in order to debunk the paper, and it's called data butchery. As samples are chopped into smaller units to raise the p-value into statistical insignificance. It is, it's unethical, but it's also counter to the first goal of research, which is to generate measurable and testable data. It, um, I, you know, there's lots, lots of examples. What happened with the Carlson test? I mean, the test happened in the early 80s, it took four years before it reached publication. And during that time, we have to assume some statisticians, presumably skeptics, since they Psychop was running the experiment, found a way to slice the, the significant single group into three smaller ones that are not significant. It takes some skill to do that, and what a terrible waste, really, because it isn't it's anti-science as far as I can see to try and do that. The slicing and dicing also occurred in Dean's lengthy study of extroversion, introversion, which I mentioned, and it started with uh, 1,198 participants went down to 288, and then eight blocks of 36. When I recombine the eight blocks of 36 into 288, then you can see the pattern. It is a case of being holistic. You have to look at the whole, the whole block of data because if you look at little parts, you don't see the pattern. And this is what has been happening. The same happened with the New York suicide study. It was run by astrologers, but Dean was the advisor. For some reason, which I cannot explain, they split the study into three groups according to the year of death. And that took away, it was, that was one of the main reasons I think they were unable to see a pattern. The most extreme example that I can think of is with Paul Western's 2005 study of natal and progressed inter-aspects using the Sun and Venus between 1,300 couples. A very detailed study and a huge amount of work has gone into it and it's pretty amazing. Now what Dean does not mention when he criticizes the study is that the odds are that this was a chance result was 244 billion to one. And you know that the, the idea that the Sun and Venus aspects were random in, in these instances. But Dean and his team, they managed to knock this staggering statistic down in two ways. First, they removed two thirds of the sample. Don't know why. Then they added in other aspects, Sun, Sun, Venus, Venus, which were never part of the hypothesis. Does this not sound a little bit like Paul Kurtz? And finally, they divided the sample into 112 smaller samples. And not surprisingly, with this fragmented sample, they covered up the significance. But Western did not take this lying down. He has since validated his result in 2021 with a replicate study published in Coloradation with equally staggering low p-values. Effect size. The p-value is the gateway, but it's not the destination. The evidence from these 79 studies strongly support the claim that there is an astrological effect without artifacts. But now we need to know how strong is this effect? Is the effect consistent between similar claims? This is a paradigm shift within our field. Now, here we're looking at a graph on the left, sample size n, okay, and on the right, the effect size. The line with the brown marker is the threshold for the p-value. I'll explain how it works in a second. So above the p-value line, everything's significant or on that line significant. Below it to the left is not significant. And on the if it's zero on the effect size, then there is no effect whatsoever, or it could be negative. Anyway, so what we're seeing is if you have a very small sample, you need to have a very high effect size. And the reason is, say you had a group of 10 people, half of them could have the same sign, just randomly, it's possible, unlikely, but possible. In which case, you need a very high effect to be able to 
show it. Whereas if you're doing a thousand people and there were slightly more than you expect of one sign or whatever it might be, then your your effect size does not have to be very big, but because your sample size is so big and you will still get a low p-value or a highly significant p-value. So the thing is, now that p-hacking has been exposed as a way of debunking, critics of astrology grudgingly accept that there are significant tests that support astrology. But now they claim that the effect size is so low, the results could be down to subtle artifacts rather than astrological influences. Now this cartoon, which I uh, designed a, a while back for correlation, is sort of sums up my feelings at the time about what was happening with the research. We go back to an early time where there really was next to nothing, hardly any research in before the 50s. Then in the 50s, Gokulau was not so known about, but he started and we and all the so many tests that you read about had very clear artifacts and um, they're really of, of no use. And the main reason was they didn't have controls, which is really important. Then we get to the 70s. So we start to get Gokona coming in to be quite well known. He'd already been you know, doing his stuff, but he was getting very well known. And during the 80s was when he had the conflict with the skeptics. And the question really is, what is Gokwana discovering? Is it astrology or is it something else? We kind of don't know. I mean, I feel it's like astrology, but it's something slightly different from what we had assumed it would be. And then as the test started to be, there were no artifacts, the, there was significance, there were astrology, then they started to say, well, hold on, what about the effect size? So that's become much more of an issue than the actual p-values nowadays, uh, which are of course important, but it's a it's a balance between the two. How do we calculate the effect size? This is going to be the technical part, uh, and I'm going to outline it quite quickly, but I think it's important that you do understand what's going on. If you're doing a t-test, okay, Cohen's d is the standard measurement. And it's based on the difference between the mean of the sample and the mean of the control group, and then divide it by the standard deviation. The standard deviation is to do with how spread the data is within the group. But to get a standard deviation, you need normal distribution. And most astrology tests do not have normal distribution as per this diagram. It, it just doesn't happen so much in our field, but it is not impossible. If you find you do have a normal distribution, you do do a t-test, and you want to calculate Cohen's d, make sure you use the standard deviation of the sample only. Do not pool it with a control, as you will end up creating an artifact. And there are options to pool it. I, I mistakenly pooled it, but now I know better because it, it, it's a problem. Many more astrology tests are to do with pairs matching pairs is more common and that and, and this is where the effect size is measured by what's known as the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient simply call it R or Pearson's R now when your pairs are plotted onto a graph in Excel you then add a trend line and if you tick the option and it says display R squared value on the chart I mean graph but just you tick that option uh, then you will get the value of R squared. So you square root it to get R. Alternatively, you can calculate R using X, the Excel command, which is Pearson, brackets, array one, array two. And to do the arrays, you highlight, you click on the array one and you highlight the array you want of you know, your pair. And then you highlight the other one. And so they can be compared in a Pearson test and you will get the R value from that. So that's that. Now the more common, much more common method in our field is chi-squared and it's quite popular. This can be used for the goodness of fit or contingency test, also known as the test of independence. Now Cohen proposes W for the effect size and the effect size W is 
calculated by dividing the chi-square value by the number of scores and taking the square root. There are several other ways to calculate Cohen's W set out online. When using chi-squared, a contingency table is useful when you compare opposites, such as I did when I was comparing extroversion and introversion. Uh, they're opposite, so it's you can you, a contingency table is useful because that gives you a, a thing in the middle, or male versus female, or red versus black in cards or roulette. But if you have a control group, you should not use a contingency table because your control group is your neutral comparison. You don't need another neutral comparison taking you from the control group in the middle. It, it, it you would actually kill your your test, but um, skeptics will disagree with that. Um, you know. Perhaps the most common method of testing astrological claims is, is through the binomial test. It is particularly so because of things like, because aspects are very difficult to compare with other aspects due to the varied frequency. So the binomial test, which is you know either or, is a binary cho uh, choice that you have. And quite often that can um, happen. And here, the this has been quite a problem for me trying to find a good effect size. And at the moment, the best known one is the symmetrical binomial cumulative distribution. Yeah, it's known as G. <laughs> you can see why they have these short letters. And all it is is just a ratio. But I won't explain it because I'm hoping that you're going to look at the next or the one I, the one I'm going to propose later on. Um, there are formulas to convert Cohen's D to Pearson's R and back. You know, obviously that's useful, but generally these effect sizes are, they're all speaking different languages. And it's very difficult with astrology because most astrology papers don't include the, they don't include the effect size, they don't include the mean, they don't include the standard deviation. So you are going to have a job getting, extracting a good um, effect size, but you know, I, I, I would compare it to playing bingo in the Tower of Babel. So we need a lingua franca. Now, Jeffrey Dean has a neat solution, um, but it's a bit too neat. He uses an effects uh, size that he calls Cohen's kappa. It's based on the observed and the expected frequencies and the sample size. Very simple and very tempting to use because it's so simple. But Cohen actually devised it as a measure for rating performance and not it's not an effect size. And there are a number of flaws which I'm going to write about in correlation, but I'm not going to go in here, but take it from me. Uh, I don't really want papers trying to use Cohen's kappa because it's, it's, it's uh, very flawed. Anyway, but one of the reasons that Dean and other critics of uh, fringe fields like using this, uh, not a lot of people do use it, but they're about the only ones I've ever found using it, is because it tends to quash the effect size. And so I'd be very wary of dealing with this type of system. Now, now this is the part that's, in, you know, I, I, I think is important development, certainly for me. And you can calculate the effect size from the p-value and the sample size. Cohen states, Four parameters of statistical inference, power, significance, criterion, that's alpha, that's P equals 0.05, sample size, and the effect size are so related that any one of them is a function of the other three. So they're all connected and effect size can be inferred from the P value and the sample size. This is gonna be very simple. So if you obtain a significantly low p-value from a small sample, you can expect a high effect size. To achieve the same p-value from a much larger sample, the effect size is lower. This goes back to the diagram we looked at. So how can this be calculated? Well, I found a study on meta-analysis by Rosenthal and De Matteo, published in 2001, where they refined the relationship into a simple equation. Here it is. It's the significance test equals the effect size times the study size. They observe if an article contains nothing but p-values, we can proceed as follows. 
convert P to its associated one-tailed standard normal deviate Z and use the equation R equals Z divided by square root of N. Okay. As far as I can see, uh, calculated Z from P requires an online calculator or you can do the other way around. You can, you can go from Z to P um, using Excel and that's through the command called norms dist or norms dot s dot dist and then you put the Z value and it will come up with the P value and what I did was I made a table so I calculated many times in order to interpolate to get me a uh, Z value so working backwards now the formula to calculate persons are by dividing Z by the square root of the sample size should be of immense value for comparing results in astrological research and creating meta-analyses. So though few papers relating to astrology include the effect size value, all include a p-value and the sample size n. Now this diagram, this graph, uh, plot really, shows the results of 16 tests performed in the last few years, mostly published in correlation. And all the scales, as you will see, are logarithmic. And the reason for that is there's such variation in numbers. On the left, or the Y or vertical axis, shows the number of subjects known as N, or factors used, and the value of X on the X or horizontal axis is the inverse of the P value, that is one over P. I find that if you express P as a whole number, it's much easier on the decimal. And if you look at the 1 million mark, the chance that the result is random is a million to one, or P equals 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0000001. I think that's five zeros. Now the brown dash line shows the significance threshold of P alpha, also known as alpha, P equals 0.05. All results in this instance are less than 0 0.01, which equates to 1 in 100 on the scale. Uh, the circles on the left show lower significance in comparison to the circles on the right, which are the higher significance. So it's literally, that's obvious from the scale, but just to tell you. The green line confirms the general trend. Okay, and as tests, have more subjects, the significance gets higher, which is something I've said earlier, and that's just how it works. So at the bottom left, there is a small study, 38 subjects from Graham Douglas on sudden infant death syndrome using Goquinas methods. However, the significance is high relative to the study. At the top right, there are two large studies by Paul Western looking at the Sun Venus in Sinistry, we talked about it. And here the p-values are extremely low, a very high significance, of course. And when the tests are combined, the result is completely off the scale, literally off the scale. So let's move on. If you look at the meta-analysis by effect size, so we've looked at it before by the p-value. Now we change the graph and we put it by the effect size. So what happens? is that these results are now presented in a standard meta-analysis. And the sample size is on the y-axis as before, but the x-axis includes the effect size. And uh, this is good because we can start to compare studies that we know they're significant and we know they're similar, but is the effect size the same, suggesting some kind of consistency within our studies. You look at Paul Western's two studies on the Sun and Venus, natal and progressed aspects, they have remarkably similar effect size. Also in the suicide study, now Sun and Saturn in neutral reception is almost exactly, it was the same number of tests, it was a disconfirming factor in the suicide, but the same effect with the Sun and Jupiter it was a confirming factor. So they had the same effect size. Obviously Jupiter takes the risks and the Sun and Saturn exert personal control. 
apparently that's what it seems like. The other two studies that are, have a similar thing were the ones where the matching bios and the matching charts, which are to the right, and they both have a strong effect size. They're similar whole chart approach to astrology. And they are obviously there's some kind of consistency. They're not exactly the same effect size, but but similar on the scale. From this, we need to ask, how do we separate the univariate single factor tests from the multivariate multi-factor tests and the whole chart tests? These are the range. And what we see here is that the multi-factor studies tend to have a higher effect size than the single factor studies, which is what we would expect. And the one that trumps them all is the whole chart, which is obviously the highest effect size. And we just clarify it with an example. So Kyosti to Venin's measurement of the frequency of Jupiter on the sun moon midpoint, that is top left of clergymen, required a huge sample size of just over 20,000 as the effect size is small but highly significant. But isolating this detail is incredibly important as it enables us to build up larger studies when combined with other factors. We know that that factor can be included in whole chart systems. In the middle section with the medium effect size, there's uh, the suicide study with Saturn unexpected with 311 charts. And what's interesting here is though there's only 311 decisions about Saturn. Every single time when you do an unexpected planet, you're looking at nine, you know, are there any aspects with Saturn and this planet and Saturn and that planet? It's not like comparing Saturn and the sun. It would be like comparing all the planets. So it's, a, it's more of a multi-factor and that helps build up the effect size on a, even on a medium sized study. Vincent Godbrew's experiment, which is matching charts of the far right of the of the image, uh, that is in the large effect size, but the size of the group is 73 celebrities. So it's not a very large group, but of course you're getting birth details. So that's why it is so hard to do a large experiment with all the details. Now this is more than just counting multiple factors. His system weighs up the whole chart, including the subtle midpoints in each case. And this is why his effect size, R equals 0.63, is so huge. Now, a question that the skeptic will ask is, why do the larger studies have smaller effect sizes? And this happens. The p-values, seem to be lower as the as the studies go up in size. And a critic will say, well, this is because small anomalies cannot be replicated on a large scale, and therefore they should all be dismissed. Having done a few experiments, it occurs to me that actually there are two reasons why this happens. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to collect full birth data to include the time and the place of birth on a large scale. This is mainly because of the strict laws on data protection, and that's through my, or throughout the Western world. Without the full chart, large studies have less scope to use multiple factors. And as mentioned above, single factor studies result in a lower effect size. There's another point. As our field is not funded, a great many studies are small scale and researchers will direct their resources towards the results that yield the highest p-values. Now, five of the studies are what I would call pushing the envelope. They are very powerful. They're the ones above and to the right of the blue dashed line. And these studies are where the sample size well exceeds the level required for the effect size. Obviously, when choosing the sample size, these people would not have known what effect they were going to have. Uh, and so you just make it as large as possible. But these studies uh, suggest that they're both consistent and effective. Uh, Cohen would describe them as having a high statistical power. So in addition to Paul Western's two studies on this diagram, I've included his larger combined study, 
And then there's David Cochrane's recent study of bipolar disorder using harmonics. And I've only had the data from David, but I'm looking forward to reading his published study. Then there is Caius de Tarvenen's blind matching obituaries and biographies published in the newspapers with key planets in the chart. And lastly, we have another study of blind matching the charts like Hyostis with biographies from Vincent Godbu, which we mentioned before, with a sample size of 73, but a huge effect size. Now, I'm often asked, how large should my study be? What sample size do I need? And this is a good question. And there is a way of working it out quite precisely, but only if you know the effect size. So what we've learned from what we've seen so far is that most of the successful astrology experiments tend to have small to medium effect size using Cohen scale for, from the behavioral sciences. So from that, if you look at the diagram, you can see the markers between the small and the medium sizes. And the small would be 300, up to about 300 subjects. And the medium is about 30. So that's the range. So if you think in terms of about ideally 300, but if not 150 or 100, but be careful getting below 100, you'll, you know, it might work, it might not. What also determines where your proposed study is on this range is whether you're using the multi-factor or the single factor or even the whole chart approach. So a small single factor approach, such as a planet on an angle or in a sign will need about a thousand subjects. As, as a minimum base. A smaller sample can work with a clever experimental design. If you only have birth details of 100 lawyers, you need to think how would you assess their optimum professional direction if they were a client? And you would not say, ah, oh, but you have the sun in Libra, you'd make a great lawyer. That's not how it works in consultation, it's more sophisticated. So you then say, well, what's the profile for the legal profession? Maybe we talked about it, um, Libra and Venus, Sag and Jupiter, Saturn and Capricorn, perhaps as well. Then you start to consider ways these archetypes might combine within the chart. So you might consider Jupiter in Libra, Venus in Sag, Venus, Jupiter conjunctions, for example, as ways they combine. You might also look at planets in the ninth house, planets in Libra, planets in Sag, or Jupiter in the MC. And this would give you more of a kind of profile and then you can test for that. If you're given some charts of say successful barristers, courtroom lawyers, work backwards from a few examples. So ask yourself, why have they chosen that profession? So look at the chart, say, you know, astrologers are very good at what I'd call post-mortem analysis. We, we look at events and see how they happened and we look at people and famous people when we look backwards is why do they did, did what they do and we should use that skill when for when we have a sample just start looking at the sample a lot of people would say you shouldn't look at the sample but i think you should because we're in such a unique field to just get a feeling of what's how we what would go on in your head obviously you don't do lots you just do a few and then you get a feeling of you might not hit on it but you get a feeling of what to look for Anyway, this would help you create a hypothesis. And sometimes you have to actually change your hypothesis as the results come in. And this is not a, a bad thing. This is just a sensible thing, but you should make it plain. This is what you've done in your paper. So people understand the process that led you to where you've got to. In, in one example with the suicide subjects, I did not expect the Sun, Jupiter, Leo, or Sagittarius, the combinations of the, that archetype would be a confirming factor for suicide. Um, I did expect Saturn to be a disconfirming factor, that, that made sense. But, but if you don't know the direction of the result, then you have to do your calculations for a two-tailed test because it could have gone one way or the other, and it kind of doubles the p-value effectively. What, what is fortunate, I, I guess, for uh, astrologers is that we generally are testing and verifying existing traditional claims. And so we know roughly what we expect. We should know what we expect. 
because we've got a pre-existing theory. Anyway, there are three takeaways from this. First is don't dismiss small tests with marginal significance. Okay, you want your sample size to be as large as possible, but even if it's a small test and the result is not significant, you may have a strong effect size. And that's of interest because we, we, we add that information to an, another study and we can start to see a picture in the meta-analysis. So it could be very useful. Always list your p-values in full. And this is the APA say, oh, you've got to list it. it you know, you report p-values less than 0 0.001 as less than 0 0.001. And that's quite handy. It, 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 it's not too cumbersome in the text, but I will insist that the full p-value is included somewhere within the paper, perhaps in a footnote, because that is going to be important for meta-analysis. And if you really are getting a very low number, you know, consider putting it in a scientific notation. The third point is the scale of the effect size is relative to the context and relative to the field. Cohen comments, it seems reasonable that the frame of reference used for conventional definitions of correlational ES should arise from the field who most heavily use the, the correlations. So there's two conclusions. The first is, since the assessment of effect size relates to the field, astrologers are the ones best suited to decide whether an effect size is large or small. A tiny effect size by Conan's broad guidance for social sciences could be a massive one for another field. For example, 98.8% of human DNA is shared with chimpanzees, and yet you've got a huge difference with a very small effect size. Second, effect size should be measured relative to the claim. If, for example, you're measuring the effect size of people with, say, Mars in the culminating Gokula zone who become Olympian athletes, the result is minute. You're taking an average person, and the reason is only one in 10,000 people compete in the Summer Olympics. Now, if you look at the charts for athletes, well, then your effect size is larger. But if you're looking only at top Olympians, then the effect size is even greater. So, and when you quote the effect size, it, people need to know or be able to work out the context in which it's going to be used. Well, as I said, Astrologers are natural researchers. We've always been that way since our antecedents passed the night stargazing over the flat, fertile floodplains of the Tigris and Euphrates from the high towers. We recognize patterns that others overlook and we make claims that can be tested. And now we're starting to identify those patterns, verify those claims and discover how they can be applied most effectively. Thank you all.